Hello, Marina. Thank you for coming on the podcast today. I'm excited to talk to you. Hi, Shane. It's nice to be here. Good. I um, you're you're a very interesting person. You're qualified in so many different fields. You're a clinical social worker, a hypnotherapist, a nutrition coach, a Kundalini yoga instructor. I mean, <laughs> it's it's quite a list of different things and you know on top of all that you specialize in helping people and young uh, people with you know um, autism spectrum disorders and Asperger's and um, special needs of various kinds in a sort of holistic approach to dealing with all of it and a lot of that comes from you know your personal experience of being diagnosed with um, Asperger's a few years ago and so you know, who better to help people than uh, someone who's, who's been through it themselves. So, you know, we've got a lot to talk about today. Um, I'm very excited. And so how about we sort of just start off with hearing a little bit about you and your story and how did you, you know, reach this point of, of where you wanted to help people, you know, with special needs, particularly, although that's not exclusively what you do, like you do help you know, uh, anyone who comes to you, of course, but, um, you know, how, how, you know, could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I, I think it's sort of the interest started when I was in graduate school for something completely different, <laughs> speech language pathology. I was on my way to becoming a speech therapist and uh, I was going to work with kids uh, with special needs, with speech issues and such. Um, and I realized uh, because of my own mental health challenges at the time and the struggles I was having um, in that academic environment that um, I really am not meant to be a speech pathologist, even though it's I'm capable of it, but it just, my heart wasn't in it. So I asked myself, like, how can I still work with kids who have special needs and um, their families, but just in a different capacity. And so after I left that university, I was lucky enough to get hired to work for the New York City Early Intervention Program as a service coordinator, and I was assigned to a caseload of 40 families, all of whom had a child with special needs, um, many of whom had children that were being diagnosed with what used to be called PDD-NOS, which stands for Pervasive Developmental Disorder Not Otherwise Specified, which now is ASD, Autism Spectrum Disorder, but at the time that was the label. So. I was finding at the time that um, pretty much the only option given to the families besides the typical like speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy was ABA and having gone to school for speech pathology, I learned a few things about different interventions and I was not a fan of ABA. <laughs> And so I was the only person in those meetings, they were called IFSP meetings, Individualized Family Service Plan meetings, the only one um, saying to the family, like, don't let them push you into doing ABA, your child has other options. There's the Greenspan floor time method, there's, you know, many different, um, much more child-friendly, child-focused options that um, do not involve ABA. And as it turns out, um, now that I'm officially diagnosed and I'm learning to embrace it, and um, I joined uh, several Facebook groups for either therapists on the spectrum or just individuals on the spectrum. And uh, I'm noticing there's a huge discussion about the whole ABA um, issue. And most people in the neuro, what's called the neurodiverse community um, are against ABA. And I've actually mm -hmm. been, um, I've become friends with someone who is autistic. She's known that since um, 
she was a young girl, and she uh, told me that she went through ABN, that it was a traumatizing experience. So she mm. doesn't recommend it to anyone. And it's unfortunate. And, uh, huh? what, what is ABA? Could you give a little, um, yeah. I don't know the specifics of ABA and what they actually do, but what it stands for is Applied Behavior Analysis. It's a very intensive behavior treatment, uh, usually used for kids on the spectrum. Um, and it's basically to teach them socially appropriate behaviors and you know using behavior modification techniques i call it dog training um because it's <laughs> it's kind of the opposite approach to uh what i studied which was uh more of a play therapy based approach in working with children um which is more focused on the relationship the relational skills as opposed to, here's what you're expected to do in order to fit into society and be quote unquote normal, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean that makes sense, right? And um, it's good to hear that you know you you sort of faced that what they were offering, and you were like, mm -mm. like this is not gonna work. <laughs> this is not good. And you know it takes people like that and and like you to start to implement and affect change in, in these systems because otherwise who's going to do it you know i mean uh, it, it might be a, an uphill battle for you but you're paving the way for you know many people and generations of learning newer and better ways of dealing with these things and, and helping people um, in a positive and constructive way rather than just you know as you say dog training or uh, conditioning particular behaviors as if that kind of you know solves all the problems um and and i guess you know the holistic approach that that you tend to take it it it's about that being holistically um uh yeah integrated i suppose is the word and but it's interesting because you know you and i've had conversations and you know without you having told me that you had a diagnosis yourself like i wouldn't have even known right and i would have just been like yeah it was fine it's just a nice person i mean it's all good and then you told me and I, and it was quite surprising i mean you know i i knew going in because we had connected and um you know we had so i sort of like looked you up online and things like that but um it is it is unusual i suppose for me in that sense of like because typically you know you think that like and, and this is the stigma, that's the problem, and, and I'll own it, right? It's like you think that, you know, people with, you know, various levels of autism or, or whatever it is, you're like, oh, but they're different or whatever. And that's just not true. I mean, I suppose it's technically true in that there's some different ways of existing or whatever, but, like, who cares, right? Like, it's not different bad. It's just, um, I guess that's why the word, like, neurodiverse is it divergent or diverse? That like that's why it's good because it's just saying like, oh no. Diverse, although I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, it, it. Either way, it's a good word because um, it just means it's like, yeah. I mean, they're a little bit different, but you know, they just that's fine. They're just regular people, and <laughs> you can everything's the same pretty much. I mean, of course, it depends on severity and and a whole lot of things like that, but. Um, so, you know, this really meant a lot to you because you had been through some of the, you know, challenges or difficulties that these kids are experiencing, even though you didn't have the formal, um, like, diagnosis for whatever that's worth. I mean, uh, you know, it sort of does, you could sense that, like, oh, these things were a problem for me as well or they were hard or difficult and so you know from an inside take on what the best ways of like managing it were for you and what worked and what didn't work and you know how it affected you and so it was, it was uh, actually at that uh, yeah. time when i was living in new york and working at that job that i started to suspect that maybe i have some traits because i, I was really sensitive to noise so I was, how I was picking up on some sensory sensitivity which is very common in people on the spectrum um, 
And I, you know, when I was uh, spending time with friends and they would make certain jokes uh, and say certain expressions that I wasn't picking up on or didn't understand the humor in, I was like, I don't understand why this is happening. I've been in this country for over 20 years. I'm a fluent English speaker. I'm smart. Like, why am I not getting these jokes that other people are getting? Or why am I not picking up on these facial expressions? Or people would just start saying, oh, you're very book, book smart, but not street smart. And of course, living in New York City, you know, street smarts are very important. Um, so, you know, family members would say, like, you're kind of in your own world, like, um, you need to be aware of your environment type of thing, like, especially when I got mocked in New York while going to visit a client, I was totally in my own world, like, I was wear wearing my headset, listening to music, coming out onto the street of a very bad neighborhood, completely clueless about what, where I was or what was happening. And, you know, so um, basically I started realizing that, yeah, I have some challenges and I can't make sense out of them just with what therapists had been diagnosing me with up until that point, which was anxiety and depression. Um, so, um, it was at that time that I had the good fortune of connecting with Patricia Lemmer, who had founded what used to be called Developmental Delay Resources, and now it's called Epidemic Answers, and um, actually I was interviewed for her radio show as well, uh, talking about this topic, um, but basically she was the first uh contact I made at that time where it opened me up to the world of holistic therapies for um, people on the spectrum and I actually started a blog, Alternative Therapies for Autism, at that time while I was uh, working at that early intervention job. So I felt like I was being guided. This was long before I even got the diagnosis. <laughs> I was just yeah. like wanting yeah. to help the families and wanting to share what I was learning because I was also going to school at the time um, to the in Institute for Integrated Nutrition in New York City. I was uh, doing in-person classes on the weekends and learning about nutrition and different diets and lifestyle um, practices and sharing about it with some of the families who were open to it. Um, so it was just the beginnings of like my expansion into the world of holistic health and I knew that even though I got my uh, certification as a health coach at the end of that training I knew that there was something more I wanted to do I really wanted to take the work I was doing uh, through the early intervention program and go deeper go further so that's why I ended up leaving that job and starting graduate school at Rutgers University for social work which is hmm. what I now do wow and then so what led you to the point of going to see a I guess a psychologist or something like that for a diagnosis so I was at a job which I thought was my dream job I was working with kids um, in a playroom and that was like I, I've always collected toys since I was a kid I've never outgrown my toy collection <laughs> um, and I just thought wow this is amazing I'm getting paid to like play with toys with kids and all I have to do is just write some notes at the end and this is great and I thought it would be easier than it actually was. Uh, so when I started having challenges with interpreting the play, the meaning of the play, which is, you know, play therapy is very much based in Jungian interpretations and metaphors, and I was having difficulty with understanding the metaphors and, and catching uh, some of the patterns um, that other therapists maybe uh, weren't not having any issues with. Um, I was 
starting to wonder like why is this happening and then my anxiety uh, just kept going up because I would make mistakes and then with every mistake I um, you know have uh, challenges with uh, my supervisor and um, eventually I ended up losing that job and was very upset that that happened but I was really like struggling on a mental health level and I think part of that struggle was because of the autism, which people were not aware of and I wasn't aware of. Um, and so when I lost that job, I ended up going to the local career center for help. And um, I shared with them the, the struggles and the challenges I had on that job. And uh, they paid for me to get the psychological evaluation through um, an agency that they're connected with and so it was that psychologist that gave me the diagnosis hmm. and, and to be honest with you how... I agreed with the diagnosis I was kind of relieved that finally I have an answer but I disagreed with her conclusions because she concluded that I shouldn't work with people that I should just work with computers and machines and you know I just I, I showed that evaluation to my therapist and she was like this is ridiculous it's so not true uh, I showed it to my holistic psychiatrist and he was like that's ridiculous <laughs> he's known me for years as well um, so you know and and he even said he's like okay even if you are atypical you're atypical atypical <laughs> meaning in his opinion I'm atypical even among the atypical people <laughs> right so yeah I guess I mean that's interesting because you know I you know diagnoses can be a, a problem and a, a solution at the same time right where on the one hand you know it's good to be able to know what's going on and it helps to know that you know whatever it is that you're experiencing is normal or at least it's normal in the sense of like there's a lot of people that it happens to and so there's a pattern and patterns associated with it and so they can use that to you know help you understand a little bit more about why things are happening the way they are for you and how it's not just you and and so it's you know more um, inclusive and non-isolating and so it helps in that sense but it can also sometimes be a limitation um, as, like as a patient or a client because as you say it's like well because they often tend to then prescribe things that are normally associated with this whatever and that's not necessarily true for you as an individual that has different manifestations of this situation let's say you know because I don't want to call it a you know anything I mean whatever right so it can be a, a help and it does help and it certainly helps clinicians understand what's going on and how to manage it and you know from their end it makes sense but you know to just sort of categorize someone as this or that or having this or that like that doesn't necessarily always help um as we as you know as you say like this psychologist told you all kinds of weird things that just didn't make sense to you about that you shouldn't work with people or that this is what you should or shouldn't do and it's like okay i mean they don't really know you all they know is how people in this group typically um perform under certain conditions right like working with people or not working with people but uh, to just sort of give it as a prognosis or like this is fact, that's a problem because it's not true. And I mean, you know, kudos to you and to your therapist and, and your psychiatrist for being able to look at it and say like, no, this is bullshit. <laughs> like, um, I mean, I recognize where it comes from. Yeah, I actually yeah. requested yeah. that I said I'm willing to come in again and, and speak with them or give a phone number to my psychiatrist, my therapist, whoever it is they need to speak to, to update that evaluation. And they refused. They were like, no, this is, this is the final, you know, this mm. is it. So that was really disturbing as well. And, you know, as I'm 
learning now through these Facebook groups, I'm not the only person that's had some bad experiences, uh, you know, through the process of being evaluated or even meeting with a professional who maybe, uh, like I saw uh, someone post this morning about how they met with a psychiatrist having already received the formal diagnosis of Asperger's and the psychiatrist within two minutes of meeting this person was like, oh, you're not on the spectrum. You make eye contact and you're, you're expressive and you're, you're fine. <laughs> so, wow. you know, there's those experiences too, is that um, so-called professionals will jump to conclusions just based on um, maybe features uh, not being so um, obvious. You know, and I, as a therapist, I also had, like, struggled with, like, I've worked for months with a child whose brother was on the spectrum and had the formal diagnosis, and I suspected that uh, my client, the child, maybe had ADHD, but I never suspected that he was autistic, too. So when I referred him for a psychological, I was shocked when the evaluation report came back Saying that he's also on the spectrum, I did not pick up on that. So it's it's possible that you don't see it, you know, not right. faulty yeah. clinicians yeah. who just can't pick up on these traits, especially with someone who's very high functioning. Of course, and and you know, it's also the case that like as these things are now sort of more commonly spoken about as being a spectrum, right? So people fit in at various points. And, you know, there are certain characteristics of, you know, being on the spectrum, but not necessarily and not in every case. And so, uh, you know, it makes sense that like, you know, particularly if you go for, you know, psychological assessments are interesting because you don't know the person that you're going to see very often, right? The psychologist or whoever it is. And there's a bunch of testing that goes on, um, but there's not a lot of like, you know, getting to know the person at like a deeper level, right? It's very surface level questions and answers and, you know, very intense, not like simple ones, but um, it, it just goes to show how like, you know, that can lead to mistakes as well, not mistakes, but just like mischaracterizations, I suppose. Um, but so can actually getting to know someone where you then, you know, like in your case with this kid, it, it takes on a different approach because, you know, the typical signs aren't there, but they still fit somewhere along there, right? And, and I mean, I guess it all goes to show that it's like diagnoses are important or they can be important and helpful, um, but, you know, you need to be able to take it with the understanding of where it's coming from and how it might not necessarily reflect everything 100% or at least in as much as like it doesn't dictate your future necessarily, right? You still have your, you know, mental capacities and free will and you can choose to do all sorts of things and different things will give you fulfillment and meaning. And even if they're more challenging for you because of whatever diagnoses you've received, like you might still be wanting to do it because it gives you meaning and fulfillment and, you know, that sense of joy. Um, and so the diagnosis shouldn't stop you from being able to do that. And, and I guess that that's something that, you know, clinicians would need to be mindful of, I suppose, um, when, when working on it. I'm not sure if I would be as well adjusted as I am if I didn't have my practices, my, my uh, diet that I stick to, which is a gluten-free soy free, mostly dairy free diet and mostly organic. Um, you know, if I didn't have uh, my rituals, my daily routine of meditation and uh, sometimes yoga practice and deep breathing and, and different mindfulness practices um, or EFT tapping, all of which I teach to my clients. And if I didn't take supplements to help me with any kind of imbalances, in my body um, and that's exactly like what I try to impart to the clients I work with that regardless of what diagnosis they have 
Um, we live in a toxic world. And especially if they have special needs, if they're ADHD or on the autism spectrum, um, you know, or have depression or anxiety issues, most likely there are biomedical imbalances that are not being diagnosed, not being looked into because only usually naturopathic doctors or functional medicine trained doctors are able to look at that you know they do the appropriate tests the labs uh, are more specific and they ask the appropriate questions to determine what's going on and so i'm very grateful for my holistic psychiatrist because at the time that i first came to him i was still living in new york i was at that job with early intervention and became really depressed couldn't function and honestly, it felt like I had dementia combined with depression and ADD. It was just horrible. Like I couldn't remember things. I was, my attention was all over the place. I, I just couldn't function. And I knew at that point that the traditional treatment that I had been receiving just wasn't working and that I need to find a better way. So when I remembered there was this doctor giving a talk, about how he uh, specializes in autism and is actually able to reverse autism symptoms in kids. I was like, wow, I, he could probably help me with whatever this problem is uh, because if he can reverse autism symptoms in kids, he could probably reverse my depression symptoms. And, and I'm really glad that uh, I went to him. Like I flew down to Miami um, my, with my family and uh, thank you to my dad. I'm grateful to him for paying out of pocket for the hefty price of <laughs> holistic health care because my insurance refused to cover most of it. They considered what the doctor did experimental, um, which that's a whole other story. I went to external appeal and lost, and, and, and that's a, a problem in this country that we're everyone is facing um, but basically like thanks to the tests he did and the treatment he did what I discovered is that I had mercury poisoning and it was the mercury that was causing what he called organic depression because mercury can uh, cross the blood brain barrier go up to the brain and as a result of the mercury I was also deficient in different micronutrients because it leaches nutrients from your body so I had to take vitamin D, B supplements and stuff. And he was the first doctor to do genetic testing. So I discovered that I have what's called the MTHFR mutation, which is actually quite common. And it causes the methylation cycle uh, that's part of liver detox um, to be impaired. So as a result, my liver was not properly detoxifying and so there was the buildup of mercury and whatever other toxins um, which were going to the brain and affecting everything from attention to memory to mood so hmm. we really I mean, are a I mean, mind body organism like people like to separate mental health from physical health but it's all one essentially yeah a hundred percent and i i completely agree and, and resonate with that sentiment of like, yeah, you can't really separate the psychological from the physical, um, except just sort of in speaking about it. But in, you know, the reality of the biology is it's like, we're, well, we're, we're one biological creature and there's various things that happen. And it's very interesting to go into the subject of like how, you know, diet and nutrition and, um, you know, lifestyle habits and all those kinds of things can create psychiatric symptoms, so to speak, um, where, you know, I, I've heard doctors speak about how when people get checked in to psychiatric units or whatever it is, if it's a good um, program, they always have a full medical evaluation to make sure that there's nothing so-called, quote-unquote, medically a problem that's causing the psychiatric symptoms or contributing to them rather rather than um, the psychiatric being the the thing in itself 
by itself, right? And I guess, you know, there are some cases of that. I mean, I'm not an expert. I don't know the specifics of it. But, um, of course, it makes sense that, like, when your body can't function properly because of, you know, different things that are happening, that it's going to create a variety of symptoms in in you and that you experience. And many of those look like or are psychiatric in nature where, you know, your ability to regulate um are impaired your you know nervous system activation like that gets changed uh you know with like the amount of um chemicals that you you're releasing like serotonin and dopamine and things like that like when that's affected then your mood drops and um your attention you know destabilizes and so there's all these things and so so i, I my question about like let's say for um autism and nutrition like, what are the, some of the common things that people face that they don't realize have such an impact? Uh, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I actually got in trouble for even talking about this topic when I was in graduate school doing my first year field placement. Because when I was meeting uh, with psychologists uh, in like a case uh, conference, or what they call a case conference, talking about cases, um, everyone was only looking at the behaviors. It was purely behavioral approach. They were doing functional behavior assessments and looking at how to change behavior. And I was the only one because of what my doctor opened my eyes up to and what I personally experienced, I was presenting actual research papers from different academic journals and biomedical literature talking about the different patterns that they found in people on the spectrum, you know, different metabolic uh, deficiencies, uh, gluten intolerance, um, you know, gluten, dairy, casein uh, issues, um, the MTHFR and other kinds of genetic mutations which make detoxification challenging, um, nutritional deficiencies that were being not even looked at. So I, I actually have since, I read another research study um, that was done by a nutrition consultant that I follow, and she also specializes in autism and works with a lot of families of kids on the spectrum. Her name is Julie Matthews. And it was a research study, I think, from March of 2019, where um, they looked at uh, kids on the spectrum, um, and uh, they changed their diet to dairy-free, gluten-free, casein-free, soy free and then they also did some supplementation and some uh, detoxification protocols and they found that the majority of the kids actually their symptoms improved dramatically from this protocol so yeah. that just goes to show that you know diet really does make a difference and like my doctor he's a you know, he definitely is a big advocate also for dietary changes. And also many holistic doctors that I follow, including Dr. Mercola, um, in his nutritional assessment, which anyone could take online for free, you'll see that regardless of your type, whether you're a protein type or a carb type or somewhere in the middle, he recommends gluten-free and uh, if you're going to have dairy, he recommends raw organic dairy. So that's just across the board, you know, what I've seen as far as recommendations. And also I, I read The Grain Brain by Dr. Perlmutter. He's a retired neurologist and nutrition researcher. And in that book, he talks about how grains are actually bad for the brain and gluten specifically being the protein that's found in grains such as wheat, barley, and rye, and it's commonly hybridized and, you know, grown in the GMO form here in America. Um, so that adds additional problems to, you know, the fact that wheat is now being added to different foods, especially if you're eating out a lot. Um, and what he found is that anyone with a neurological condition 
uh, if they continue eating gluten and grains in general, it acts literally like glue in the brain. So it, it causes the brain to not function right. And the way I put it to most people, like if they say, oh, well, you know, gluten-free is just a fad. Why should I do it? Blah, blah, blah. You know, or, you know, why should I follow whatever the strict diet is? I'm like, well, if you know what fuel is right for your car and it's the premium fuel, but you keep putting the wrong fuel is it normal for you? Is it okay for you to expect the car to function optimally? I mean, wouldn't that be what Einstein considered it, you know, being an idiot, like doing the same thing and expecting different results or trying to solve the problem with the same mind that created it in the first place? That's right. Right. And so, like, people having studied what I studied and experienced what I experienced, like the way I perceive people, you know, uh, in general is that, you know, they're, they're unconsciously incompetent and they're not even aware of what they're unconsciously incompetent in. Yeah. And so I yeah. often say, what you don't know can hurt you. <laughs> like, you right. know, ignorance right. is not bliss. <laughs> So. Yeah, ignorance is mentally bliss, right? Because you don't know that you're doing this damage to yourself, but in reality, it's a problem. Um, like but I mean, but I mean, standard American diet and yeah. have high inflammation and have all kinds of mental health problems and physical chronic health problems, and then they wonder why? Why am I feeling like crap? <laughs> Well, yeah. maybe what, you should what look fuel at what you feel like eating your body. Yeah, the fuel. Yeah, no, 100%. And I mean, you know, I, I guess anyone just about would relate to the sentiment of like, well, when you eat healthy, you feel better. Like it's it would be crazy for someone to be like, I eat all this junk and fast food all the time, and that's when I feel my best. Like, I don't know that anyone, I mean, I guess maybe it gives you some emotional relief and, you know, there's various things associated with sugars and, and whatever. Like, I mean, you know, it, and it's also, you know, very person specific. It's not like a a general statement of like, everyone should do exactly this, this and this. It's like, no, you need to know what system you're running and how the diet affects you specifically and you know it might be very different for different people um and that's okay you just need to know what you're what you're dealing with right some cars run on yeah some cars run on diesel some run on petrol some run on electric um and th that's fine you know but you can't swap them over and expect it to to land good results um but so just No, what go for it. Yeah, go for it. That most people take better care of their cars or whatever machinery that they like to drive as their toy um, than they do of this vehicle, the, the human body, which you only get one of in each lifetime. If you believe in past lives, you might get more. But <laughs> in one, in this current lifetime that we're all living in we only get one human vehicle and so why do you think that is i think because of education we're not educated properly you know kids go to school and no one talks about you know self-care no one talks about um you know dietary uh, holistic diet and lifestyle practices these are all things that i learned um, from my mom initially when I was introduced to the macrobiotic diet in high school thanks to her and then eventually through the Institute for Integrated Nutrition and other places I have studied and so this is just not a conversation like and the federal school lunch program is just atrocious I mean not a, not only is it not organic but it, it's all GMO and it's it's all junk food and uh, fat, fat, omega-6 fat-laden foods, fried 
very few vegetables. If there are, then they're usually overcooked and processed. And, you know, having worked in the school system here in Florida, I, I was just appalled at the kind of nutrition that was that the kids were getting. I mean, even like yeah. the free breakfast, like they start off with just pure sugar. And then, of course, there's going to be problems behaviorally. You know, their parents give them Mountain Dew and Coca-Cola to drink. And, and yet these yeah. are the same yeah. kids that, that I was finding had ADD, ADHD symptoms. Well, guess what? Food colorings and sodas and artificial sweeteners are going to only make the symptoms of ADHD worse. So, you know, right. to me, it's right. just incredible to see, like, you know, I saw the direct um, correlation, you know, between what these kids were eating and, and how they were behaving. But unfortunately, this is a, a macroeconomic issue. This is not a micro issue. This is a macro nationwide, statewide, government level issue. And it's a big right. problem in right. our country. But do you think that it comes from a place of like, well, we just, as a society, we haven't got to that point yet of knowing these things and implementing them at like a broad level. Like there are certainly individuals um, like yourself and, you know, like these experts that you've been talking about that are, you know, going out and sharing this wisdom with everyone and being at the forefront of being like, well, we need to fix this, we need to change it. And of course, these things are tremendously difficult to change at such a huge level, right? And there's all the, you know, the politics and the bureaucracy and the economics and all that kind of shit involved in it too, which is just unbelievable hurdles that need to be overcome. Um, but so you're, I, I think you're right that it's, it's a sense of like, well, we haven't reached that point as a society where that's what we're teaching people from a young age, but not from like a, at least from my perspective, it's like, I don't think it's like a conspiratorial thing to like do this on purpose. It's just like, well, we don't know better as a whole society, right? And so that's how we need to start implementing things to make better changes. But like, yeah, we don't teach kids about self-care. I mean, mental health only fairly recently, like in the last few years, has become something that people can actually talk about. I mean, before it was so stigmatized or whatever. I mean, you know, it just, and it's something that everyone just about faces at some point in their lives to varying degrees, right? And um, it just was not, perhaps it wasn't, wasn't well enough understood. It wasn't widely enough accepted for all sorts of reasons, right? And so they, there's no teaching of self-care and of meditation and of, you know, the impact that like your thoughts and your emotions have on you and on your world and um, how your nutrition affects everything. And yeah, I mean, it's just because it's people don't know, right? I mean, I didn't, you don't know. I mean, the sort of old expression, which is sound, can't sound, sounds kind of silly, is like, well, you don't know until you know, right? And it's like, well, how were you supposed to know otherwise if no one taught you? Um, and you know, then it takes people like you to be able to say like, well, I learned this and now I'm going out and I'm, I want to tell people what's up and I want to help people learn and do better and get better so that, you know, we can improve society as a whole. And with each individual that or group that you help, that has a direct impact on society as a whole, right? Because other people will see it and learn from them and people in their groups will be like, oh, well how did you get your kid to do so good or, you know, how, what made the difference? And then they'll start talking about what worked for them and it sort of spreads, right? It's a little bit more grassrootsy um, and it takes a lot more effort, but that's, that's kind of where we're at. Right. Um, and it is, I mean, it, it's a, we, we sort of don't approach uh, things very well, I'd say as a society. And we also tend to like silo things, right? So we have like, physical health, mental health, nutritional health, energy work, like, and, and, you know, that makes sense too, just from the perspective of like how people specialize in things and how much information is out there. And so, you know, people sort of do specialize in those things, but actually the holistic approach 
is what works best is to be able to go to someone or to a team of people who can say, um, okay, well, you need to, you know, work on this, 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 and this all together because they all interact and they all work in synchronicity to create other challenges and problems or, you know, solutions and peace and joy. Um, but that is on the rise as well, right? Like I wouldn't be, I wouldn't want to be too cynical about it. Like there are lots of amazing places and people who are doing these things. It's just not so mainstream, I would say. Would you agree with that? Would you agree with that? Mainstream and, and the other problem now, I want to make a plug with being in the pandemic. Not only is it not mainstream, but now, um, I think it's very much more nefarious than you've made it out to be because now we've got this tidal wave of uh, coerced vaccination tactics, um, you know, on a global level. And uh, most people that I know who are like me, who are holistically trained, um, and most holistic doctors that I follow are not fans of this so-called vaccine, which is actually just an experimental biological agent. And um, since there wasn't animal uh, research done like there would be on a standard vaccine, we essentially become the lab rats. So, um, you know, I am very disturbed by what's happening across the world with this pandemic and um, you know, the tactics that are being used to get people into fear mode and get them to take this vaccine because otherwise, oh, then you can't go to a museum and you can't enter a cafe and you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't go to school. And so I, I actually just a few days ago signed a petition with this organization called I Stand for Health Freedom because I stand for health freedom. You know, I'm one of those people that I feel very strongly that our First Amendment rights are being taken away, and um, it really should be a choice what we put into our bodies, and any vaccine that we allow should also be a choice and should not be something that's forced or coerced or manipulated. Um but that's unfortunately what's happening. And so th there's a huge war going on that mm, some people are not aware of. <laughs> and it's a war on a global scale. Um, and it's really hard when you're not in the mainstream because a lot of these doctors that I follow, including Dr. Mercola, are being censored on social media. They're being censored all over the place. Because yeah, the pandemic's a shit show. Right. The mainstream narrative is, is what they want you to believe. So any mm -hmm. anything that says otherwise, anyone that speaks out against it, you know, gets censored. And to me, being from a former communist country, former Soviet Union, this is not that different than communism. Not that different than a tyrannical government that's basically telling people what they should believe, how they should behave, you know, and complete control. So yeah. what's happening in this country and many other countries is just appalling to me. Like I'm about to go to France to visit family and um, I already found out that they're going to be instituting the COVID passport policy. So in effect, because I refuse and my family members are refusing to get the vaccine, we will not be allowed to go to museums or restaurants or wherever a lot of people are gathered. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, it's really scary what's happening now. Yeah, the pandemic's really opened up a, a Pandora's box of, you know, societal problems and, uh, made a lot of things worse and really raised the tensions in a lot of the different areas. And, you know, people are doing things that they wouldn't normally do. And, you know, like government and systems are working in, you know, complicated ways that, you know, may or may not end up being very good and helpful to people. 
And yeah, I mean, the censorship is is really the big problem that I, I agree with as well, is that it's like, you got to let people say what they're going to say. I mean, you you know, even if you don't like it, just let them say it. I mean, you don't have to agree and that's fine. Like that, you know, you're not going to agree with so many things in the world, but to, you know, stop people from saying it is is pretty crazy. And I mean, you know, the arguments for it are, I mean, I can understand where they're coming from, but it's like, yeah, but that's not how it goes, right? Like, that's not real life. Like, the censorship causes more problems than you think you're solving with by doing it, right? And you're just poking the bear with a stick, so to speak, right? Um, and, you, you know, it makes the problem, the so-called problem, worse than... Uh, than better right it doesn't actually help anything and i think it's pretty crazy and i mean i guess social media companies have the right to dictate these kinds of things um because they're private companies but you know it'll come at whatever cost that comes to them in the long run um and yeah i mean it is pretty insane and um yeah i don't know i mean it's i don't have any hard views on anything because I feel like I just don't know enough uh about any of it so I'm like I don't know man like you know I it, I'm happy to talk about it and to hear what people say and that's all good but just you know from my perspective I'm like I honestly I don't know enough about anything to make any sort of educated uh you know statements on things because I don't come from a position of being well learned in or studied in any particular field or expertise and so for me it's like oh I can speculate this or this or I like what this person said or I like what that person said and it makes sense to me but you know at the end of the day I'm like "Mm, I don't know what's I don't know what's going to work or what's best or what's not and you know I hope all all that I can do is, is just hope that things work out the way they should or they work out well which may or may not happen and uh you know sort of pray that we don't end up in a communist regime um because that wouldn't be good for anybody Mm -hmm. (laughs) um well this podcast took a very unexpected turn so which is fine uh i'm I'm happy with it It, it's all good right but we got about you know like 10 15 minutes left um if you would if you don't mind i I have some questions about hypnotherapy and how you integrate that into into your practice so where exactly does that like fit in or is it just part of the holistic approach it's a big part of my holistic approach because i find that hypnotherapy is a very rapid effective intervention to use with people for all kinds of problems whether it be anxiety depression cravings for substances um chronic health conditions you know it's just so great for so many things and it's especially an evidence-based intervention for trauma Mm -hmm. which i know how who doesn't have trauma like even just uh being born is traumatic (laughs) so that's trauma number one um so you know i i work uh with people if they're open to it using hypnotherapy to help them resolve Um, childhood traumas and limiting beliefs that they have that they develop in childhood and create more healthy coping skills for you know functioning now as adults and having healthier relationships having better self-care practices having you know increased self-esteem and increased self-worth and improve um, positive beliefs about themselves because really our subconscious mind is driving the majority of our behavior and if we don't address uh, what's there at the subconscious level to me that's similar to not doing the labs that functional medicine doctors would do and not addressing the toxins that are being built up in your body that are going to the brain I kind of see them as parallel so you know if you're just working on the analytical mind level or the conscious mind level you're not going to get rapid change in behavior or rapid change in you know on the level of belief so 
I'm a big fan of hypnotherapy, obviously. That's why I did the training in it, and that's why I'm, I'm very passionate about it. And I've received it myself, and it has really transformed a lot for me. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I guess it makes sense, right? You're treating cause versus symptom, kind of, yeah. in, in some capacity, right? You're not like trying to reconstruct the thoughts that you consciously have. You're trying to do it at the level of like where they come from and yeah. ad- address it at, at the basic level. And so, you know, when you're, when, let's say a client comes to you, right, with some, let's say, I, you know, let's say I come to you and I'm like, I have, I'm depressed or whatever it is. Um, how do you know like which systems you're going to want to integrate like do you first go for the um, hypnotherapy or do you do a nutrition workup or do you do um, you know like breathing and meditation stuff Um, or do you customize it I guess it would be to each person and and their specific needs right and what would work best for them And, and also not everyone is open to having a conversation about diet and lifestyle changes. Uh, but if I sense that they are open, I certainly bring that up. Um, I try to bring that up at the beginning because I feel that, you know, best practice says to, like you said, rule out medical causes. But most people aren't doing that. So I let them know they need to see a whole ideally a holistic practitioner or functional medicine doctor that will test them you know for possible food allergies nutritional deficiencies etc um and you know i can certainly help them in terms of teaching them mindfulness skills teaching them ways to change their thinking patterns and behavior patterns but they also need to address whatever is getting in the way as well which, you know, I'm not a doctor and I can't do that, but I can at least provide the information and, you know, recommend and also share what are some common um, problems that I've seen both for myself and my clients that also can cause mental health challenges. Um, So, yes, it it really depends on the open-mindedness of the client and, you know, how ready and motivated are they to really do the work? And those that are, you know, open to hypnotherapy, I just let them know that it's basically um, you're going to be in a deeply relaxed state. There's nothing to be afraid of. I'm not going to make you quack like a duck. This is not stage hypnosis. (laughs) This is therapy while in trance. That's hypnosis is, is the trance state, you're inducing the trance state in someone. So you're doing therapy while someone is in that trance state. You, right. They're still able right. to talk, answer questions. You know, they're completely alert and aware. They're just very relaxed. Their brain waves slow down and they're in a um, more uh, possibly theta or delta brain wave pattern which is what we get to when we're in meditation, if we're lucky. So, um, you know, it's a really safe uh, process, and I make it very comfortable for them. I usually encourage them to lay down, have a blanket. You know, it can be done virtually as well as in person, and it works just as well both ways. Um, And I usually create a recording of aspects of it to help them you know, then reinforce what we did and I encourage them to listen to the recording on a daily basis. And since I have done this work for myself, um, I, I've seen firsthand how beneficial it is and how quickly it, it can change your limiting beliefs and your sense of self, your sense of self-worth. You know, like one of the common limiting beliefs that everyone carries around but may not be aware of is I'm not good enough. And that's something that I used to also have. But as a result of hypnotherapy, I no longer feel that. And and that belief creates so many problems in so many areas. So clearing that belief just opens up new possibilities. And 
you know, it's, it's really about freedom, freedom uh, to use your mind to achieve what you desire as opposed to having the mind go against you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it's certainly a up and coming and very influential field. And I think many people find it tremendously helpful if they're, as you say, open to it, because I guess to a large degree, not everyone is because they think of it as, I don't know, woo woo stuff or whatever. Right. And it's like, okay, I mean, you're free to dis dis like disregard it or however you want to think of it. But for those who are open to it, I mean, it can be tremendously powerful. Right. And you, you get to deal with the limiting beliefs at a much deeper level than just being like, well, why can't I, why don't I feel good? You know, it's, um, in a sense. And I guess to some degree you can achieve that as well in psychotherapy, but it takes longer or it, um, requires a lot more like cognitive effort and, uh, various things, but you know, psychotherapy is good for its own sake and it does different things and, um, works on, on different issues, but, um, it's all good, you know, whatever works for people. Um, but listen, Marina, thank you very much for coming on today. I've really enjoyed this conversation. We covered a lot, a lot of cool, interesting things that I think will be very, you know, informative to people and, and you know, open some people's eyes about just what's out there and, and what the world is like and, you know, the different ways that things are in, in existence. And so if people want to find it, find you or find more about you, where should they go? I'll include links in the description, but, um, you know, do you want to promote your website or your Facebook or something like that? Uh, so I would love for you to find me first through my website. Um, it's www.marinawellness.com. You can also just contact me directly. My mobile number is 646-831-0585. I'm very responsive, and um, I offer free initial consultations, either over the phone, WhatsApp, or Zoom. Um, and even if you're not in Florida, if you're in another part of the world altogether, I can still work with you, you know, if you're interested. And I would love to be of service. Amazing. Well, thank you again. And I uh, look forward to having you on again soon and continue our, our conversation.